Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Nick, and I help direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into tonight's event with Matthew Israel, Sarah Friedlander, and Massimiliano Gioni, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We wanna thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are excited and honored to host Matthew Israel for the launch of his new book, A Year in the Art World. Matthew is a curator, writer, and art historian with nearly 20 years of experience working with some of the most influential contemporary artists and art institutions. He currently lives and works in New York. Joining Matthew tonight in conversation are two individuals featured in his book, Sarah Friedlander and Massimiliano Gioni. Sarah Friedlander is a deputy chairman of the post-war and contemporary art department at Christie's New York. In this role, Sarah works with important private collectors, institutions, and museums, advising on acquisitions and sales both privately and at auction. As a key leader on the international team, Sarah is also responsible for top consignments and for maintaining Christie's reputation as the world's leading art auction house. Massimiliano Gioni is the artistic director of the new museum in New York where he has organized numerous exhibitions. He has also curated many international shows, including the 2013 Venice Biennial, the 2010 Guangzhou Biennial, the 2006 Berlin Biennial, Manifesto 5 in 2014, or 2004, excuse me, the first new museum triennial in 2009. His current shows at the new museum include Peter Saul, Crime and Punishment, co-curated with Gary Carrion Murayari, thank you for your patience, and Jordan Castile, Within Reach. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming first Matthew, is, uh, Matthew, and a bit later, Sarah and Massimiliano to the stage. To start us off, we have Matthew with an introduction to the book. Well, thank you, Nicholas, and thank you to The Strand for that kind introduction. Uh, and. Thank you to The Strand and my publisher, Thames and Hudson, for organizing this event. And thank you all for being here to celebrate the launch of A Year in the Art World, what my nine-year-old daughter calls the banana book. In terms of the format for this one-hour event, I'm going to give a short introduction to the book. Then I'm going to ask questions of Sarah and Massimiliano individually. After that, we'll have a broader discussion amongst the three of us, and finally, we'll take some questions from the audience. To begin with, I want to briefly acknowledge the current environment. It's been a spring and summer that has been at times terrifying, confusing, and endlessly complex. And I hope this evening can, above all, offer some brief respite, some deeper insight into the machinations of the art world, and some hope for the future. So we're here tonight to discuss my book, A Year in the Art World, which came out on Tuesday and releases in the UK on October 15th. A Year in the Art World is a detailed chronicle of the inner workings of the contemporary art world, a world that has become much more globalized and transparent in the last few decades, but is still considered closed off and obscure. The book was meant to be a time capsule of a certain moment. And while I thought it would feel that way after five or 10 years, it's in some ways one already. In this book, I take the reader on a cross-continental journey through a year in the field of art to lift the veil on a culture that I hope comes across as multifaceted, adventurous, nuanced, and meaningful. From Los Angeles to New York to Paris and Hong Kong, I encounter artists, curators, critics, gallerists, and institutions, and uncover the working lives of art world figures who range from the renowned to the unseen. The book is based on exclusive interviews I conducted between 2017 and 2019. Thus, a year here is a construction. And in these interviews, I've tried to explain to a broader audience what working in the art world actually, what people working in the art world actually do, 
what drives people's interests in working with art, and how do artworks acquire value, and how has technology transformed today's art world? A year in the art world is divided into the four seasons of the year and 15 chapters, each of which captures a particular domain of the art world. In the book, among other experiences, I visit the studio of the artist Taryn Simon. I discuss the world of galleries with Adam Sheffer, the vice president of Pace. I hear about how biennials and biennales are curated from Rujeko Hockley and Jane Panetta of the Whitney and Ralph Rugoff of the Hayward Gallery. I explore the world of art fairs by attending Art Basel in Hong Kong and recount an event I hosted during the fair featuring artists Jeff Koons and Hans Ulrich Obrist of the Serpentine Galleries. I speak with three curators, Omar Khalif of Sharjah Art Foundation, Koyo Ku of the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art Africa, and Massimiliano of the New Museum. And I had the lovely opportunity to discuss the world of auction houses with Sarah at Christie's. So that's a quick overview of a year in the art world, which I hope you'll take some time to explore. And tonight, I'm very happy to be joined at the event by Sarah and Massimiliano. And I'll start with Sarah, discussing Sarah and her work. And I'll just wait for her to come on screen. Great. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Massimiliano. Thanks for being here. Um, so Sarah, let's start with you. So we spoke at Christie's in December 2018, and I chose to speak with you because you're one of the most influential people working today in the world of modern and contemporary art. And I felt that your career trajectory could offer a good understanding of what happens in a major auction house. In the chapter on auctions where your interview was central and basically the only interview, we discussed a lot of things from the life cycle of an artwork to the responsibilities of certain jobs, to the hierarchy of professional roles in the marketing and sourcing of artworks, to the importance of the auction catalog. Now, to start off with, can you explain to the audience who might not be familiar with the auction world uh, what your job consists of? Sure. Uh, it's funny to think that everything you just said got completely blown up, but okay, an auction house job. Um, we sell art on the secondary market, art that's already had a life, sometimes many lives, uh, from all over the world of all different kinds of mediums. We sell books and manuscripts, uh, handbags, dinosaurs, uh, da Vinci's, uh, Monet's, Wal Wal Warhol's, Calder's, and sort of everything in between. The work has to uh, be of the highest quality in whatever category it is in. It comes in, we photograph it, we put it in the catalog or online, and then it gets marketed and sold to the highest bidder. And so tell me like what your particular responsibility is. And then I just, a side note, if someone can help my mom with the tech on, <laughs> uh, on the chat, that would be super helpful. And my, my screen is freezing a little bit, so I hope I don't okay. I'll freeze in some like weird way. Um, okay, so I have always been in the post-war and contemporary art department. That was the department I started in. I had a very classic and traditional upbringing where I started as a sale administrator and assistant in the department, answering the phone, keeping a sale runner, arranging shipping for uh, little sculptures from Geneva to Rockefeller Center, um, shipping things from Hong Kong to London and then to New York, arranging photography, dealing with insurance, sort of all of the like business logistics around what it means to bring one work of art from one part of the world to the next part of the world. And then I uh, started actually cataloging those works of art. So I spent about four years, four thrilling years in the warehouse, literally like telling stories about objects, measuring things, doing condition reports on things, researching them, um, pulling up comparable works in the market so that all of the information that appears in the catalog was correct and accurate for each work of art. Yeah. And then so I don't- Can you just stop for a sec, the, the yeah. warehouse, can you just tell people where that is? Because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, the, like, it's like somewhere out, you know, outside of New York City, but actually, the, there's a warehouse in Christie's. There's like sub level. Christie's in Rock Center is like a tooth. It's like 
there are multiple like sub levels and you go deep, deep down. Um, and then there's, there's like the vault for the furniture, which I used to go and like sneak around in. There's the vault for the fine art. And then there's like the secret fancy vault for like the very fancy things. We have storage um, in offsite facilities in Brooklyn and Long Island city, but that's kind of as exotic as it gets. We're, you know, in New York, we're pretty much in that center. Right. Um, I interrupted you. So you were you were talking about kind of the next stage for yourself. Right. So I was in the warehouse, like in, you know, basically sweatpants every day, like cataloging works of art, hanging out with art handlers, um, like friends with the shipping guys. It, it, it was sort of like I was working in this corporation, but not corporate at all. And somebody who is no longer at Christie's, but is now at Sotheby's, like tapped me on the shoulder and was like, okay, enough of this like playing around. It's time for you to actually start selling things and actually talking to clients. So I like bought some new clothes and washed my hair and made it upstairs, like out of the subterranean um, warehouse and started selling art. And since then I kind of didn't stop. Um, I started with a sort of mid season sale. So I was selling like, call jerk washes and uh, like Ray Pettibone works on paper and um, you know, the occasional Warhol, like unique silk screen print. And then I started running the day sale where I actually got to decide what went on the cover of the catalog. So, you know, I was really into Jack Goldstein. I put a great Jack Goldstein on the cover. I was really into the Selmans. I put the Selmans on the cover. This was 2013, 2014. Um, then I left Christie's to work at a gallery for a hot minute, went back to Christie's and have been there ever since. So tell me a little bit about like, okay, we'll talk about post COVID and in a little bit, but pre COVID kind of what was, what was your like week like, um, what were the sort of, um, what were the sort of main focus foci of your, of your job? Sure. So I, I guess as I started selling more and more and talking with more clients and kind of working on bigger consignments, I started working on more kind of cross departmental areas of the business. So I work on a collection that had a amazing Diego Rivera and a Monet and a Richard Prince and some jewelry. So I put together teams of different specialists and um, administrators to go and pitch for business, work with the proposal team, the marketing team to put a collection together, sometimes as big as 50 or 150 works, sometimes just one work um, and think about how best to market it and put it in a sale and then sell it. So I would say most of my week was spent at an airport because very little of this job one can do sitting at one's desk. So, you know, Thursday I'd, or Monday I'd be in you know, Palm Beach, and then I would fly to Aspen, and then I'd fly to Philadelphia, and then I'd come home, and I'd go to LA, um, and then of course traveling for the sales all the time. I mean, it's I've this is the longest in fifteen years I haven't been on a plane. I mean, I'm sure it's the same for Massimo too. I mean, we, you know, I just haven't haven't gone anywhere. And so, so you're in that in that way, your your job was really seeking out and manage these, managing these relationships with high value collections around the world. And, and for that, you know, I know that we've talked about Chrissy's database being so important, but we've also talked about how, you know, you get to be in your type of position for having a type of uh, encyclopedic knowledge of where the works are. And can you just tell us, like, I know, you know, uh, I, I, you told me that you have a photographic memory and so I think that's probably a real asset for what you do. Um, not, it's not the whole thing, but, uh, but obviously it's, it helps. So um, can you tell a little bit about just like how, how important that knowledge of where things are is to what you do? Yeah, I mean, you know, data is obviously a very hot topic right now. I have many friends who are working specifically in this industry. And I think that there's a group of tech people who actually feel like they don't need us at all, right? That they can take like all the information that we have about who's who and who owns what um, and their entire collection and then just make transactions off of that. Um, but I firmly believe that it's very important to have a real knowledge of the art and a knowledge of people's collections and having a memory of what somebody's living room looks like so that when you come the next time you see what's moved or what's changed is a way in which you're able to bring new things into a collection too. And that is the 
sort of matchmaking joy of what it means to sell art. Yeah. So, so the last question before we move on to to bring in Massimiliano is, um, you know, how how do you, how would you describe how auctions sit in the larger art world ecosystem? You know, where what's their place, their function, kind of their power? Um, ooh, uh, I think that. Look, I think we feel a need for people who need to sell things. I think some people might argue that we can make markets for specific artists and influence their uh, curatorial success in some ways. I don't know that that's true. Um, it certainly influences the primary market to some degree, but I think we don't really have anything to do with the work of what it means to be an artist and make art and get that work exposed to the public. I think we are really, and I don't think we should, I think we are a, um, a, a machine that helps people sell art and a vehicle that helps people buy art and experience art uh, on a very kind of transactional level. Okay, well, I'm gonna, we'll stop you there and I'll, I'll, we'll come back to you in a little bit. Um, Massimiliano, thanks so much for, for being here. Um, thanks for your patience. Uh, so I also spoke to you in December 2018, but at the New Museum. Um, and I, I chose to speak with you because you're widely considered to be one of the most important curators in the world. One of your major achievements being the aforementioned artistic direction of the 2013 uh, Venice Biennale. And I was also interested in working with you or in speaking with you because your career thus far reflects the emergence of the curator as a pivotal art world role. It kind of parallels the career of many curators of the last decade. And, uh, and your work gives voice to a number of the challenges such a, a career involves. And so our conversation covered a lot of things, such as how you discovered the world of curating after pursuing a career as a writer, how you spent time <clears throat> learning the ropes of the profession from curator Francesco Bonami, uh, your feelings about immersive art projects and also how museums uh, measure the success of their projects. Now, uh, just like Sarah, to start with, can you kind of explain to the audience who might not be familiar with, uh, with the art world um, what your job consists of? Uh, well, what I always say to the immigration office at the airport, where I say I'm a curator and then they look at me very puzzled and I say I organize exhibitions of contemporary art. So that's what I do. Uh, which means I choose the artist and depending on the type of exhibition, I choose the artworks that are featured in the exhibitions. I conceive, let's say, the narrative of the show and, and produce a catalog to go with the exhibition. And in my role as artistic director of the new museum, I'm also responsible for uh, uh, the identity of the museum and the program of the museum in, in terms of uh, the sequence of exhibitions and, and you know, what our offerings are. Yeah, and I know when you grew up, you, you really didn't have a sense of like what a curator was. So can you talk about kind of how you, how you got to be a curator and, and um, you know, sort of what that um, track was like for you? Because I feel like most people, you know, curators become such a mainstream term now. So most people are now familiar with it, but, but that was not your experience. Yeah, actually, you know, recently, on, I still have an AOL address, which I think uh, dates me. And on my <laughs> AOL, I've been uh, starting getting these ads of a, um, a, a kind of retail shop called Curateur. So I think we have definitely jumped the shark. Um, but, you know, when I was growing up in Italy and also in France, you know, the, the term of what people do in our job was... Um, closer to conservator or commissaire. And, and so, you know, the, the term curator, I think, developed more in the 90s, uh, particularly for a generation or two before mine. So the generation, let's say, of Ansur Lecobris, of Francesco Bonami, who has helped me a lot early on, of Okwi Enwitzer, who sadly died last year. Um, I always uh, joke that for the longest time the word curator wasn't recognized by Microsoft Word, you know, whenever I typed. And that was a nice exercise in modesty to remind that our job maybe didn't even exist. But anyway, I, I grew up um, with a passion for art, uh, a passion for books. And so, you know, I'm also particularly 
thankful to the Strand, which is a, a kind of university, <laughs> a free university of sorts, where I spent many, many hours and spent many, many dollars also uh, <laughs> acquiring great books. But so I, my encounter actually with art was with books and uh, uh, some of the books were the Arte Povera book by Germano Celant, who also sadly died earlier this year, the dematerialization of the art object by Lucy Lippard. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a small town sort of in the province and, and so the function of books and magazines was very important before the internet and, and that, that was how I encountered art. Um, so I grew up thinking I would become a writer and uh, uh, you know, in Italy, there were two kind of models. They were Achille Bonitoliva and Germano Celant. I didn't even know they really put on shows. I thought they wrote. Um, and, uh, and so that's what I wanted to do. And, and we had this great magazine that still exists called Flash Art, uh, which was founded actually in 1967. And, uh, and so in a sense, I knew I wanted to work there incredible platform that, that was very much part also of my upbringing and eventually after studying art history and philosophy i did end up working at flash art and flash art also had an office in new york so after a couple of years of the, being the editor of the italian edition i came to new york to be the editor of the american edition the office was on broadway and 11th so just a few steps from the strand in the building where uh, the assembly was destroyed in the meanwhile where marcel duchamp had the studio briefly and um and so when i came to new york you know i i think i realized that uh, not being a native english speaker uh, a lot of what i thought was my gift and my trade was kind of uh, erased by the fact that i had to work in a different language and um, and also the the times and the spaces around me were changing and so i i kind of gravitated away from writing and more into organizing. I also understood that, you know, maybe my temperament, my character was um, more interested in uh, being closer to artists, let's say at the genesis of the artwork, at the genesis of the presentation of the artwork, rather than being, let's say, on the receiving end. You know, I always thought that the critic, particularly the critic as a kind of an objective judge of taste, uh, um, you know, his or her role was to to look at the artwork once it was finished. And I thought of myself maybe being more interested in witnessing that birth or witnessing the moment in that, in, in which the artwork is shared in the world in, in the exhibition. And, and so I, yeah, I learned to, to work with artists uh, in putting on shows. Yeah, you, you said something in the book um, about kind of moving from, you know, not wanting to be around when the artwork was was kind of done and and really wanting to be in the mix and i, I thought that was really um that resonated a lot um so in your in your mind right now what what is the significance of a curator and kind of how is that how have you seen that identity change over time well you know uh, since we are on zoom one uh, obvious answer is that the offerings are such and the amount of information is such that we need people who edit and create connections and narrative and stories um that's when i'm optimistic you know i i also uh, until before the the pandemic i i thought that maybe the role of the museum was also um coming to an end under the pressure of uh, a entertainment industry that had become more and more pervasive and that was exploiting the world museum to, to create um, experiences that were of consumption and entertainment that was they were vacuous and and uh, and um, basically just a background for selfies. I think maybe that threat has disappeared, and now though we we live in a moment in which, uh, in a sense, the uh, the um, art world or the art industry is going through a process of uh, uh, self analysis and self criticism that is also effectively uh, putting the museum into a crisis of, uh, um, of scrutiny, of, uh, uh, of uh, reconfiguration of its uh, foundations. And, um, and still though, I think uh, there are um, many places that are so conducive for the exchange of ideas through images, 
such as museums, and, and so I still think they should be defended. And in a sense, my role of a curator, it's not so much to defend these institutions, but to create places where, uh, I say, where people come to make the experience of the unknown. And I know this sounds a little cheesy on me, but you know, I, I think the museum is a, a kind of gym for the mind <laughs> and for the eyes. And it's a place where basically we learn to coexist with what we don't understand, or, or we learn to mm, practice to understand uh, the unknown. And, uh, and uh, thank God, there aren't that many places like that in the world. I think of libraries in similar ways. I think of books in similar ways. And, and so hopefully we'll be around for a little longer. Yeah, so on that topic, um, how do you see, like for, for people unfamiliar with the new museum, how does the new museum, wh what identifies the new museum uh, you know, in this space of museums, uh, uh, not right now, but sort of just like generally um, in your mind, how, how does it differentiate itself? Well, I think he has a, um, I would hope he has a, 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 on one hand, a polemical role in the sense that it's not a place where um, values of preciousness and uh, importance are uh, celebrated, but more where they are discussed and tested. Um, we are a place where uh, uh, a lot of new information is presented. So I think one of our specialties is to give the first uh, museum exposure to, to great artists, and that has been consistently the case. You know, we we always pride of, uh, let's say, you know, having an Adrian Piper exhibition 20 years ago and, uh, and having a consistent track record of showing artists who then end up in the auctions or end up in the museums uptown um, with, a, with a few years of uh, uh, anticipation. So I think we are a place again where, uh, um, where ideas are discussed and tested and where artists are uh, also uh, less uh, celebrated as a, a kind of known accepted quantity and more uh, uh, presented in, in, with the strength of uh, a polemical position or the strength of a, a new idea that, that needs to be discussed and tested and looked at together. And, you know, I think obviously Manhattan and New York keeps changing, but until not long ago, we were the only museum downtown and, and that is somewhat reflective of uh, our nature, you know, we thought we were closer to the places where art is made, uh, closer in a sense to the studios than to the the temples of uh, Museum Mile, and uh, and I think that is reflected in the way we approach art. We are very, very international, very global, and uh, and I think that has remained true for more than forty years, uh, and uh, and that I think hopefully has put us in a place where many institutions are now. Uh, um, with a few years uh, of um, or, or a few years ahead, right? So, uh, so now I'm going to open it up for for both of you, and and you can also ask me some questions now too. So, um, my first question for both of you, and maybe I could answer this too. But um, how have the last six months been for you? Uh, you know, I I wrote this book. It it kind of uh, finished last year. Um, Massimiliano asked me in preparation for this, what would the book be like? if I had actually uh, included March and April in it. Um, and I, I could answer that question in a little bit, but I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering for both of you, you know, since March, what have your, how, how have your lives changed? Uh, how have your work lives changed? I, I would say there is no work life. There's, <laughs> there's just the life. Um, I had a baby in January, which was one of the goals of, that I actually talk about in the book. Um, and so kind of having a newborn without like access to my frenzied life of being on airplanes and visiting people and seeing things all the time was like almost a dark hole for like a good six weeks. We left the city, we went to Woodstock and it was, it, it was horrific in many ways. And I think I feel so, um, I mean, I feel mostly great, mostly grateful in general. But so after that six weeks, I sort of started pulling myself out of that hole and started calling people, mostly because I was just kind of going crazy. And when you have a newborn, you can't like, you know, 
make sourdough and you know read books all day like you're with a baby so i started calling people um calling clients calling you know friends and um the weird thing was people kind of still really wanted to buy art people were interested in knowing what i was seeing people were interested in um making connections and so with not so much of an ease of logistics but with a kind of like scrappy sensibility each of us at Christie started like operating our own little like spaces within our homes. Um, and it was really interesting. We had to put a sale together, which happened in July with no catalog, which like no one knew how to get their head around because the catalog is like the most important thing in the auction world. And for people who love books and buy books and use books as a portal to something else, whether they're, you know, uh, exhibition catalogs or auction catalogs um, to kind of get rid of that was horrific and scary, but we put it all online and we kind of built this online platform for people to bid and buy and put a sale together that did pretty well in the middle of July when like we never have sales because everybody's in, you know, San Tropez or whatever and nobody's focused. So it was a kind of amazing experiment in um, uh, the sort of sustainability of the market. Um, obviously we're down, like we're all down. Sales are tougher than they were this point last year, but the um, that need or the interest is still very much alive and present. New people are coming into the market every day. So while everything's changed, it's also kind of the same. Hmm. Massimiliano? Uh, you know, on one hand, it feels like dog years, but or, or dog months. You know? <laughs> it's a, it's a, and as everybody, I think we have had this experience of both um, acceleration and uh, slowdown. Now, I think uh, uh, we have all witnessed a, an incredible, you know propeller propelling force towards a future where we may or may not be comfortable in and at the same time we have uh, witnessed you know hours of boredom or slowness um, in terms of you know the profession or what I can talk about um, you know I started out the lockdown um, in some cases even with the sense of um, being energized by it you know I had all this myth of Giorgio Morandi in, in his studio in Via Fondazza uh, during the Second World War and, you know, just painting in the middle of the bombings and never leaving. And, you know, this idea of a sort of uh, a quiet uh, dedication and resistance in, in carrying out life. I had, you know, uh, another great Italian intellectual who sadly died. Alberto Arbazino wrote his first novel. He was called The Little Holidays. And it was a kind of ironic description again of the Second World War uh, when people left the cities and, you know, he would describe that sort of interregnum of silence and fear as the little holidays and trying to cultivate culture in that moment. Um, so there was that sense of, uh, you know, maybe also a delusional heroism <laughs> that, you know, I thought we we're going to get out of this together and it's going to be a, an exciting time. Obviously, it was also a time of terrifying choices for our industry and, you know, terrible cuts to be made. And suddenly, more than ever before, my job was, uh, you know, changed dramatically from uh, being uh, in part at least dedicated to art and also being dedicated to the emergency of the moment and, and the calculations of the losses and so on. Um, and then as for all of us, I'm sure, you know, uh, the month of May came and, uh, and America changed again. And, um, and you know, what should have been also a moment of, I think, excitement for change and for a sense of uh, participation and reckoning was also tinged by fear and by, um, you know, all these sentiments they were still going through. So I think even the six months are probably you know, a moment before and after George Floyd's murder and uh, um, and that has changed also the climate dramatically. And, uh, and you know, now we are in this fall that, you know, part of me looks at Europe. I have so many friends and I still work in Europe and I see that the fall there feels like a spring and here the fall 
<laughs> Hopefully, it will not be, you know, a continuous fall. It will be a change, but um, you know, there is so much uncertainty and, and so many also tough choices and um, that still have to be made. So there was a long, long answer. <laughs> So, Sarah, I mean, you, you both, I mean, well, Sarah in particular, you ended on a kind of optimistic note. Um, but, you know, long term, I mean, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the book was about the influence of, of digital. You know, we had no idea this was going to happen. Um, we've seen the art world move into, you know, digital everything, online viewing rooms, et cetera, et cetera, all these kind of new features. Um, uh, the auction houses did they they did a, a kind of migration, um, but like, what do you think? Or do you think that's going to be a long term uh, kind of st uh, move that's going to stick? Do you feel like once you know once people start to once we we get to a point where we can resume some sense of normalcy? Uh, do you think there's going to be a backlash against all of the digital and um, you know people are all you know? It's going to be a, a 10x uh, kind of immersive experience, you know. Going back to what Massimiliano was was saying, um, you know, people really want the in-person. You know, uh, auctions are going to be double attended. Um, uh, where you're going to have to bring in, you know, risers. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Look, the art world has resisted the use of technology for a really long time. We all think we're very special. Um, like every industry before us, before they succumb to it, um, we think we are we think we are above it because we are so rarefied and amazing. Um, I also think that at the same time, like every time I went to a fair, everyone talked about how boring fairs were. And every time I was in an auction, I would look out into a sea of people, and with the exception of a few people who would raise their paddle, everyone was like bored and on Instagram. So yeah. I think we're all kind of using this opportunity to take a step back from a lot of the IRL fluff that has infiltrated the art world. I would put dinners and galas in that section too. Um, so I think that there's some tech things that are really good, right? Like bidding online is really good. It's a lot of fun. I bid online yesterday for some chairs. like you do it and you watch it and you get this like adrenaline thing and it's good and it's efficient and you can get rid of this idea of like a big day sale, which nobody cares about very, very quickly and in a very cost effective way. I go back and forth and I go back and forth on catalogs because I love catalogs. I do think that a lot of this content lives digitally and looks pretty good digitally. Um, I think, you know, books are really expensive. Not everyone can afford books. If you can look at a book online in that way, like that's pretty cool too. I do not think that anything can or ever will replace the experience of someone standing in front of a work of art. And even in this insane digital world in which we live in, whenever I go to MoMA or the Met or go to Venice or the Louvre, like there are a thousand people and yes, they're taking selfies, but they're there. I don't think that that goes away. I think these, gyms of the mind, as Massimo said, like people are going to need them and they're going to need to do them. And, you know, hopefully it's more new museum than museum of ice cream, no offense. But I do feel that, I do feel that in terms of people buying art, sure, it's fine to see something on a PDF, but most people are still gonna wanna see things in person. And I hope we can figure out together how to strike a balance there. So Massimiliano, uh, like, how do you, what's the long-term effect on, uh, on museums? I mean, I, I know every museum is different and there have been some pretty dire reports on kind of the broader landscape about how many museums are going to survive. But like in, in general, you know, for museums that people in the contemporary art world are, are familiar with, does this mean things like, you know, less shows? Does it mean like, um, I, I don't know, what, what are what are some things that we can expect? Well, I mean, you can see the immediate effect, you know, I don't think any New York institution is opening a show this fall, um, which also results in all the media just talking about how museums are doing everything wrong because they don't have to write about shows. And, you know, so the most immediate effect is, a climate of, uh, um, you know, 
continuous scrutiny and tension, if you ask me, even before uh, discussions about in real life versus virtual. Uh, obviously, you know, incredibly tough economic conditions and uh, and for uh, for many many people in uh, in museums. Um, you know, I I do feel and I've witnessed it. You know, in July when uh, uh, when galleries started opening again, that there is. There is nothing like that sense of going into a room with an artwork on the wall and 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 encounter a, a, you know the, the the point of view of another person who has showed you something you hadn't thought about and uh, um, of course you know you can get all that feeling digitally too most of the time though it's a kind of reminder of that experience you had in in the physical space and. Uh, you know, I hope that won't go away, or maybe it will go away for some people. But um, I, you know, I'm, at this point, I'm old enough that I want to kind of see <laughs> the, you know, I want to still have a, an experience in real life as long as I can. You know, the on the other hand, I think I don't remember if he made it into the book or not. But we spoke about literally before the pandemic. You know, I was um, concerned, having seen in a sense the, the end of records. The end of books. That's in the book. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I started thinking, are we going to see the end of uh, museums and the end of um, galleries? And, you know, I hope we don't. And, uh, you know, we also, it may be a meager consolation, we all know that in, in the toughest recessions, some great art and some new ideas developed for art and artists. And, uh, uh, you know, many of uh, the people who were... Uh, uh, reaching incredible prices at Christie's until a few years ago, had uh, started making art in the post-1987 economic crash and in the early 1990s when New York reinvented itself again as a, a place uh, that was very artist-friendly. So who knows, maybe that, that will happen again. Mm. So I think um, I'm going to bring Nicholas back because I think he's going to um, bring some questions in from the, the group. Um, Nicholas, are you still with us? We should be talking more about your book and less about us. But. Oh, we <laughs> this is just, it's an opportunity to expand the chapters. Thanks, thanks for the promotion. And I, I think when you said something about the book, it actually brought up a little button on the on the bottom. So yeah, um, voice I a, can I ask the first question? Yes. Can you talk about, you talk about the cover? <laughs> Do you want the honest answer? Yes, always. Okay. So um, I had some... get copyright. What was it? The easiest to get copyright? Oh no, no, <laughs> no. I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, I, I probably had some really boring, uh, sort of more academic ideas for the cover. Um, and uh, before I even had a chance to bring those up, the genius people at Thames and Hudson um, recommended that I use this. They were said they said this is this is the cover. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, it's funny because I, I focused on one artist in the book and that was Taryn Simon, if, for those of you that have read the book, uh, and not Maurizio Catalan. Actually, Maurizio Catalan is not in the book. Uh, yeah, he sort of is. <laughs> he sort of threw you, right? <laughs> right. You're, you're his muse or his, uh, or his, um, you're sub you actually played him, right? Or substituted, <laughs> you pretended you were him. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, they were pretty stern about that being the cover. And I think I, you know, I, I think at first I was um, honestly, I was surprised and uh, and not that interested. And then um, and then it just became clear to me. I asked some of my friends that that I grew up with who who aren't particularly involved in the art world. And they they knew about the banana. That was they 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 asked me about the banana immediately. And I feel like there's ways in which that work really resonated with a larger population and and you know part of part of the way that i like to work is to connect with people that aren't just part of the insider art world and that was really kind of core to to what this this book is so i felt like you know after all that was probably the best um the best um uh choice and 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 my my kids liked it so that's also the kind I of should, i should also add as a proof of my legendary eye that uh, Maurizio was uh, a very kindly creating, had agreed to, to make a piece for our gala 
to support the new museum, I believe, two or three years ago. And he came with two proposals, uh, one being a sculpture, which is then the, the piece we made, and the other being a banana, which at the time was a, a, I don't remember if it was a bronze banana painted to look like a banana or an aluminum banana. <laughs> so it was still more of a sculpture. And we put it on the wall and we looked at it and I said, that's never going to work. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> it's, uh, it's become somewhat of a... Uh, Soon it will be sold at Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. We have any other questions from the, the group or do you have other questions from, for us? I've got some questions from the audience when you guys are ready for them. We're ready. Um, real quick, I just wanted to say uh, I resonated with something you said, Matthew, about um, wanting to sort of extend the scope of this book um, to people beyond the purview of the art world, because I think it's really easy for it to get very insular sometimes. Uh, our magnifying glasses just get you know, more and more and more focused. Um, I'm an illustrator myself, if I didn't mention that already. Um, so it's far from high art, but it's still within the realm. But um, I appreciate that sentiment. I really want to, uh, I want more people to have an interest. So I like that. But enough of me blathering, let's get on to audience Q&A. Let's see, here is one. Uh, Massimiliano, who were the two people you mentioned as your models for writing before transitioning into curatorial practice? This is a quick one that we just yeah, got. I mean, um, I say this with the greatest respect. I wouldn't think of them, and this is the irony, as great writers, um, meaning stylistically and formally, but they were, let's say, more than the, the gray eminence. They were the two the two popes of Italian art, and they are Germano Celant, who sadly passed away this year because of coronavirus, uh -huh. who was a curator and a writer, uh, mostly known for founding or, or naming the movement Arte Povera in 1967. And the other was Achille Bonito Oliva, is Achille Bonito Oliva, who turned 80 this year, who is known um, maybe more in Italy than abroad because also his prose is so completely untranslatable that he reads him in America. But he was very, very influential and popular in, in the 80s, also in, in the States. And his claim to fame, among many others, is to, to have uh, launched the so-called trans avant-garde, which was the way in which uh, the return to painting in the 80s was described in Italy, but also in the United States and uh, in France and in many other places. Awesome. Thank you for addressing that one. I've got a pretty good one here. It's sort of a two-parter from Julia. How easy or difficult do you feel it is to move between these different fields within the art industry? And uh, the second part is for the young art professionals who may have started out as a writer or gallery assistant, but want to learn about working in other industries, what advice do you have? So they're both for me, sorry, the question. Well, no, I think- it's for, it's for everyone, but- Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. so go ahead, yeah. Sarah or Matthew. Well, let me just, yeah. How easy is it to move from like working at a auction house or a gallery to a museum or vice versa? Is that the question? Yeah, that seems to be my interpretation. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't think. Um, I auction think- Auction house to gallery. Sorry? The auction house to gallery isn't that hard. Right. Well, it's not, yeah. no. I mean, look, there are great examples of people who have who have done it, but you can kind of list them on like two hands. And I think that it's it's quite rare for a curator to decide to transfer to the commercial side of things, or for like a salesperson to go get their PhD and like start making shows. It's it it happens. It's just not it's not so it's not so common. And in terms of gallery to auction house, like, yeah, that happens, that happens a lot. I will say as someone who worked briefly at a gallery, um, but who had grown up in an auction house, it's quite difficult because even though it's the same in many ways, it's just culturally so different. And, um, and I think that the expectations of both are different and it can kind of maybe take a minute to figure that out. But, um, and I think, I mean, look, even just thinking right now in the time of Corona, I think it's really tough. Um, and I think 
uh, jobs are difficult and feeling like you can get a paycheck every week and do well is difficult for everyone right now. Sorry, that's maybe a more depressing answer than you wanted. But maybe Massimo Liano has a better answer. No. Well, um, no, I think it depends what you want to do. You know, as a, as a curator, I think you aim at uh, delaying the transition to the commercial art world until you are in your 60s <laughs> or 70s. You know, it's your pension plan. I'm joking, but... Um, we will hire you whenever <laughs> with I, I think it really depends what moves you, what what excites you, you know, that writing is a solitary uh, job or more solitary than curating. Um, and uh, um, I think it's, you know, there is no recipe, but I would say it's harder to move uh, from the profit to the nonprofit with some credibility than the other way around. So, uh, but you know, again, there are no no rules really, and and we are in such a moment of change that that those even rules could change. I think, uh, you know, it's um, the the only suggestion I have. And right now, you know, the situation is also so dire and uh, and tough uh, that I don't know if it's time for suggestions. But I think if you can imagine doing one of the jobs for 12 to 16 hours a day, then just do that one. <laughs> I, I couldn't do, I don't think I could speak sales for uh, 16 hours a day. I, I can do what I do for as long as I want. And, and that's why I can only do this, you know? Uh, Matthew, anything to say or should we move on to the next? Uh, well, I just I have one thing to add. I mean, I think, you know, uh, I've had a few kind of uh, conversations with people looking for jobs in this environment. And I feel like, you know, one one piece of hope that I've seen kind of in, you know, studying alternative art institutions is that, you know, in these times, uh, you know, it's like um, there's some great entrepreneurial spirit that comes out of things like this. And, and you know, when when there's not a lot of money going around and everyone's not chasing the kind of fame and, and fortune, um, you know, some things that can organically come about that um, that really kind of have some lasting power. And so I think there's there's a lot of those stories that people follow. You know, I think the new museum is actually one of them. You know, it's sort of like an upstart institution that came out of like a, somebody, you know, leaving uh, a prestigious curatorial post. So, um, you know, I think that's that's one piece of hope. Um, you know, and, and uh, but it's it's a hustle right now more than ever. Yeah, this actually kind of relates uh, this question we're about to transition into a uh, question for all three from Andrew. Do you uh, do you feel as though the decentralization of places to view and buy art will in turn decentralize the power of those who sell and curate art in those spaces and will lead to a more democratized art world? I think I need you to repeat that. Sure thing. Yeah, uh, it was big, big words in there. Um, do you feel as though the decentralization of places to view and buy art will in turn decentralize the power of those who sell and curate the art in those spaces and will lead to a more democratized art world? So I guess putting more power in the hands of the artists themselves or smaller galleries, et cetera. Um, I could start this off with just one observation, which is that, uh, you know, I feel like one place we've seen it is the decentralization of the, the art fair right now, because, um, you know, the bigger fairs aren't happening. So you see the outgrowth of things like uh, Gallery Platform LA, um, you know, galleries creating their own art fairs. Um, I think there's there's a temptation to think that that's actually decentralizing power, but I actually think it's uh, both decentralization of power and then also uh, it's a kind of secretly like a further aggregation of power because you're losing the sort of internationalism um, of, of uh, the sort of spread of power. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's also ways in which I think it's interesting um, because uh, I think there's a pushback against the kind of uh, Amazon influenced uh, aggregator impulse in the art world and this move towards creating like smaller 
uh, uh, curated uh, experiences for people that can only take you know small amounts of people um, just because of the physical uh, you know necessities of our, of our moment. That's a really good answer. Uh, does anyone have anything to add, or shall I move on to another question? <laughs> that, was, that was a pretty uh, thought-provoking answer, in my opinion. Um, all right, here's a lighter one uh, from Elena. What kind of painting would you describe your book as? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of painting would I describe my book as? I, I guess I have to answer this. Um, uh, I'm fiercely organized. I try to uh, I try to to make this um, as user friendly as possible. I believe in narrative. I believe in trying to um, uh, clarify things for other people that might not be in sort of more insidery art world things. So uh, I would say it's um, maybe more like a Agnes Martin um, or like a Pierre Mondrian or like a Donald Judd. I guess I'm moving in the sort of minimalist uh, camp here. So, you know, uh, real sort of refined logic. Um, I don't know. <laughs> that seems like a fair answer. I think that's well, good. It's a, I would say it's a gallery of portraits too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right, well, wish me luck because I feel like I'm on the verge of a sneeze, but I'm gonna bring it <laughs> forward. Uh, this is from Gisela. What are the art schools, galleries, or exhibitions you go to uh, get to see works by emerging artists, mm. emerging in quotations. I'm going to have you both answer that. With the, so it is art schools, galleries, and I don't uh, know, you know. Let me bring it back up one more where time. Do you, where do you go see emerging artists? Uh, yeah. Like what galleries, what art schools, sort of what institutions, where do you find emerging artists? You know, I I don't know if I first of all if I can or want even to name names and uh, um, and I've always had a conflicted relationship with the idea of emerging artists as my job being that of uh, um, you know funneling the emerging products into the system. So I mean, if anything, uh, if there is a style to what I do, is often being that of uh, looking a bit outside the, the um, expected path. Um, you know, so I always joke that I want to spend, going back also to what Sarah was saying, you know, I want to spend as much on books as uh, others spend on airline miles and the same, you know, I, I have made some of my dearest discoveries uh, by looking at books and, and spending times with uh, exhibition catalogs um, and then, of course, you know, the galleries and the schools and all that are part of the, uh, the training that is necessary in, in our profession. But I, I take so much more pleasure also in um, meeting friends uh, between covers than um, at openings. So <laughs> I'm just saying, maybe yeah, I, I, agree with friend, that. You know? I, I, I always go to the shelf, but I also think that, you know, there's this idea of an emerging artist as someone who's like, very young, fresh out of school, like in a studio in Bushwick or something. But I'm actually also interested in the forgotten artists who aren't emerging because they're no longer alive, but maybe didn't have any recognition during their lifetime and curators and other collectors kind of bring the work to the, to the fore and people can start seeing it. And Every museum that has a permanent collection, um, you can go and see work by an artist you've never heard of before and go down a train of like who they were and what school they were in and what art they were making. And it can be a really fascinating, fascinating journey. As I mean, I should say as a good neighbor and also as a true believer in, in you know, we the new museum is uh, part of an ecosystem in the Lower East Side of great galleries. Uh, and I'm sure many also struggling galleries now, and, and now the Lower East Side has somewhat migrated to Tribeca, and I think so many exciting discoveries can happen there. Tonight they are open until late. I mean, they're just closing now, but um, I think, you know, a stroll in the Lower East Side is always uh, uh, fruitful for, um, for learning. 
you all for your answers. Um, I actually got so enthralled in asking questions, I forgot to keep track of the time. We um, are just about at time. So apologies for those who asked good questions that we didn't get to, but um, thank you all for coming. And a tremendous thanks to Sarah, Massimiliano, and Matthew. Um, congratulations, Matthew, on the launch of your book. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Um, for everyone in attendance, I have just recently placed a link in chat where you can purchase the book as well. Um, there is a, a conspicuous green button in the middle and bottom of your screen that you can press. Uh, we are about to adjourn the room. So if you would like to purchase a copy, be sure to click that link right now. Um, but first and foremost, thank you all for having this conversation with us tonight. I'm sure everyone who's watching at home really appreciates it. Um, so yeah, big thanks. Thank you to the strand. Thank you, to the thank strand. you. Thank you so much. Thank all you, right. everyone. Good night. Everyone have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.